and yes, we are recording this session. Yeah, so allow me, we have Steve, who will be our facilitator later tonight. Good evening. Yes, and we also have Carl, Sam, Billy. Come in, come in, don't be shy, come on. <laughs> Stewart and JJ. Yes, so um, yes, this is our team and we worked really hard to make this event come to life tonight and a quick shout out to everyone for coming here to support us. Please, come on, clap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right, before we jump in, I just want to do a quick introduction. So here we have our panel, Adela who is a co-creator and host from Castle Design Life. And we also have Shen, who unfortunately is not here today because she's having a holiday in Japan. But Adila will represent, represent her on her behalf. And we also have Leonard. Leonard, where are you? He's right behind there. And Egg, he's right there. And also, finally, we have Steve, who will moderate the panel discussion at the end later. <laughs> Yeah, so, and uh, we also have Shen. Yes, a quick shout out to Shen as well. Where is Shen? Shen, yes. So we want to thank you, Rakuten and Shen, especially for opening up his door in order to make this event come to life tonight. And also his team for setting everything for us. Yes, and maybe Shen, do you want to come and share a bit about what you do and your team? Yeah. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Shen. I'm a director of UX and design at Vicky. Vicky is a video streaming service that really focuses on Asian dramas like uh, K-drama, C-drama, J-dramas, and we are really catering for the American markets probably right now. And we're really happy to host this event today. It will be our last event this year in this space. So uh, have fun. Thank you. Yes, and we also want to thank you Figma for sponsoring all the food outside. And we saw some Figma folks here. Yes, oh, they're hiding at the back. <laughs> yes, thank you for coming to support. And also thank you for designing this amazing tool. You seriously make our life so much better. And a lot of people are noting, you see you have a lot of fans here, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you to both our sponsors for supporting us. You really, the support mean the world to us. And yes, um, I'm going to call Adila forward to start the session. A round of applause, please. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Hi. Hi, everyone. So, um, do I go in? There's an echo. Okay, yeah. So, um, hi everyone again. My name is Adila. So, just a funny story. The last time I was here, I was a participant like you guys. And this second time I'm here, I'm a speaker. So, it's a big upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can tell, I'm a bit nervous because my partner is not here. But, I mean, like, yeah, why not? Just right. So, so basically, my, my sharing will be about our podcast, Kiasu Design Life, and how community actually became the heart of our podcast. So basically, just a bit um, info about us. We are podcast design based in Singapore. And we started out in 2022. Now we are 2023. We are having one year ahead. And basically, if you guys are, I mean, if you are guys listen to our podcast, uh, you will always start with welcome to KSDL. So you can hear my voice and Shuan's voice. So we, why the name Kiasu? Because the thing is, we find that we wanted to connect with Singaporean designers. And I feel that when we say Kiasu, you can easily think, yeah, designers are Kiasu, right? So we thought it would be a cool name to, to use. Next. So basically, um, Simi is KSDL. Simi is a slang for what? So what really happened was uh, back in 2021, 2022, we, we decided, we came together and then we decided, hey, we are both avid podcast listeners, but the current design industry podcast always very Western media focused. So there were times where I would listen to a podcast and I realized 
oh they are speaking about winter they are speaking about summer they are speaking about uh, at their supermarket and all that i wish i was listening to someone talking about some offer in ntuc or some auntie fighting with the cashier i'm like yeah if only we can have that couple of cars hey why not we do it yeah so that's why we thought how about a podcast that resonates with sg designers next so a bit of origin story if you can see closer, but I don't think you can see. So we started out in 2021. Actually, Shuan wasn't my friend. <laughs> yeah, she, she's not my friend at all. We met online on, on Figma. So back then in 2021, uh, when COVID happened, I was quite active on Clubhouse in 2020. And then I met Zoe, who was the founder of FOFSG Discord server. And she introduced me to the Discord server. So that's when I told... Um, like we, we were chatting in a thread and I said, oh, I'm interested to, to start a podcast, but I wasn't sure what yet. Then Zoe said, oh, Shuan, this other designer also wants to start a podcast. Maybe you guys should say hi. So I was like, okay, hi, bye on the 2021. And then a year went by. <laughs> But it was totally silent. So there was like no movement, no anything, no talking. So on 2022, I asked her, hey, how's your podcast journey? Ah? Then she said, uh, nothing. <laughs> I was said, I also nothing. <laughs> okay, then I was then I had this idea. Okay, why not we just combine forces then? Since you want to start something and I want to start something, but we have no idea how what, what you want to start. But we just know we had an idea of starting something together. At the same time, we thought, right, I think we just need an accountability partner because that's how I felt in the past as well. If I would do projects alone, it might not get started. But if I have a friend or a few friends doing it together, you have a partner to rely on. So that was what happened. So what, what we did was we did it very like bootcamp style, like very basic. We just did it, do it remotely. So there were times where I would record, then my children would come knocking at the door. And I'm like, okay, stop, stop, stop. My children are behind. Or uh, maybe we're recording, talking, talking, talking. Suddenly, the internet cuts off and I'm speaking by myself. <laughs> yeah, so it was a lot of struggle. But we did it in the end. And we, we decided, okay, let's not plan so much ahead. Let's not have a season one, season two, season three. Let's just record according to what we want to talk about. So that was what happened. And then after a year of recording online, we decided, hey, why not we just meet up and record together? And that point of moment when we met up, that's where we sparked the vibes and all the different uh, connotations and all the different conversations that we have on offline was much more genuine when we have it online. Yeah, so uh, along the way, we gathered insights from the design community that they wanted to be more local focused. Because at the start of the podcast, we were quite generic. We just went with, oh, um, what a first year designer should be doing, um, sorrows and all your new joiner. So we decided we got feedback that they said, your name is Chiasu Design Life. Why are you not talking about Singapore's topics? So we decided, okay, let's go more locally focused. Next. So just a bit of background of us. Um, for every place that we go, we always take a picture. <laughs> we are like tourists, basically. So we have different pictures. So uh, Shuan and me do the content strategy. Um, she does a lot of the um, audio editing. And I'm like the PR of the podcast. I do the promoting on social media. So sometimes it's me that answering you on the IG. And the thing is, she has this unique um, ability to come up with puns. And whenever I speak something... I mispronounce things. Like previously, I would say um, Figma of friends instead of friends of Figma. So I was always making this mistake and then she always just laugh it off. Next. So as I mentioned before, we actually eventually niche down our episodes. So as you can see, originally, episode one to seven, maybe it was a very generic design topics, but then we eventually got feedback and we changed it and we, we focused more on UX for MRTs and then um, how Singapore public transport is designed for dementia. So what's interesting about this one for episode was we actually uh, got in touch with someone who was a dementia advocate. She herself, suffers from dementia so when you spoke to her right she tells us i'm i'm raising awareness but did you know that at the same time i'm losing my mind yeah when, when she told us that we were like like got smacked like shocked like, basically here we are two girls chilling and chatting and having a laugh but she's serious with her job so we thought that by having ksdl we, we were actually raising more awareness about this next 
So in general, behind the scenes, we are quite chill. We don't really have a fancy setup. We are just in a small booth <laughs> most of the time, squeeze, talking to each other. And then sometimes we will have like ice cream or lunch together. So we are just like two friends rambling about. But of course, we make sure that our points are good in our podcast. Thanks. Yeah, so um, when it comes to our podcast, we actually build it with community in mind. So as you can see here, when we are hosting our podcast, we always make sure our content uh, touching on experiences in our jobs and also um, having some recommendations of design resources or maybe other designers or local initiatives that will be useful for the design community, like how you guys are here, right? So at the same time, we feel that this a uh, cycle, a mutualism process where as we give recommendations to the community, the community is also also giving feedback and recommendations to us. So for example, when we were to post up on online, that's where we have, we're always gathering feedback from the audience to, 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 to actually instill more content to our podcast. Next. So here are some of the different communities. I'm sure you guys are very familiar, like Design, SG, Telegram Chat, um, FOF, SG, IXDA. Yeah. Next. So, just to wrap up my sharing, basically the first takeaway that we learned so far running the podcast for a year, uh, feedback loop with community is really valuable, really actually really important from the start. So we we like to gather different feedback sources from email, DM, or Instagram, because we really feel that engaging with the community helps us to come up with the content for our next future episodes and also um, informs us if whether we are in the direct direction or maybe we should pull back a bit on certain things. Next. And uh, takeaway two, basically when we are sharing to the community, we realize our podcasts are able to get some community to share and, and just be basically very curious about what you guys are going through at work. So for example, there was one case where we talked about um, about new joiners, then someone actually offered their experience you know, about their experience at work for new joiners. And then with that sharing itself, we broadcast it on Instagram. And in, in turn, uh, it's not just informing us, but it's also informing our audience as well. Next. So lastly, we realized running this podcast, even though it's we are always behind the scenes, um, Shuan wasn't a fan of going for events. I always have to push her to go. But eventually, she she got out of a shell, and then she got out. And she, she noticed a change where when we come down for events, we actually cover a bit of experience of what we go through. KSDL becomes like a bit of a periscope to everything design in Singapore. So for example, if we were to go to the Singapore Design Week, we actually uh, record our experience, what we feel, what we think. And then at the same time, when she went to the Don Norman um, talk, so she also gathered her insights and shared with everyone. So it was to us, we believe that even though if as a designer, you are not able to be there, if we are able to be there, we can give you some takeaways that you can learn. Yeah. Next. So that's all from me today. I hope to see you guys on our next episode. Thanks. Thank you, Adila, for sharing your journey about your podcast and also really like how like you didn't know share that all. And so you from strangers, you became friends and then you became collaborators. Yeah, so it's really nice to see how like you can get her to come off a shell and really to put more of herself into this work and to inspire more people in the community. Yeah, and by the way, we also have a QR code right there. So if you have any questions for the speakers along the session, do scan it and submit your questions. And later, Steve will do his very best to moderate the questions and raise it during the discussion later. Okay? And also one thing before... I call you up, Leonard, before that. Um, I think um, we have a few couple of people who lost their ticket um, to get through the gate. So we have Siti Aisha and also Afik Binti Abdul Rahman. So if this is your uh, ticket, please come and <laughs> claim it. And also to keep your ticket or else you'll get stuck behind the gate and you can't get out. Okay. 
Okay, yes. And up next, Leonard, it's your turn. Yeah, so Leonard will share about um, tools and responsibility and, and responsibility of skilled labor. So over to you, Leonard. Can, can I drive the, the laptop? Yeah, can I, I think it'd be better if I do. Okay, it works. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Leonard. Um, first, can I just mention something that people don't talk about usually? Um, one of the reasons why I started getting interested in public speaking in the first place was because I've always had this natural um, stage fright. So there's a sensation you get whenever you start a, a talk, usually in front of a, just a big crowd of people where your body like floods with adrenaline and it lasts for like a couple minutes. So that's what I'm experiencing right now. Um, it happens every time and you kind of never outgrow it, but it, um, you know, it's, it's good to practice this because you can like deal with it. Okay. Um, thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, all the other uh, organizers. Uh, thank you, friends of Figma. Friends. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I've really seen the, the love and the dedication that these organizers put into uh, making these events special. So it's quite an honor uh, to be invited to speak on this topic, uh, very near and dear to my heart community. My talk has this concise title of Tools of Collective Work and Responsibility, uh, which is a mouthful in English, but uh, it's, it's the, the common translation of a single word in Swahili, Ugima, uh, which for reasons I hope will become apparent over the next 10 to 12 minutes, um, I have named it. Uh, and also my goal by the end of this talk is to inspire some of you bright, talented, smart, uh, design enthusiasts to reflect on what is driving you to acquire more skills to be able to use tools professionally. Um, so at the end, I'm going to ask you a question. What will you do with your tools? Okay, we're going to talk about the specific topics. So we're going to talk about respect for tools. We're going to talk about respect for tool users. And then I'm just going to go into kind of giving a background on how I came to love tools uh, and some illustrative examples. So if you know who I am, it's probably as the founder of the local meetup group, Singapore Product Design. And if you haven't heard of it, then please be sure to check us out because I, I believe it complements this group really well. Um, and I've always believed that community groups should not be in competition, but instead try to build a coalition to serve uh, the complex needs of the individuals in the community. Um, so there's there's room for more than one. And I think we only make each other stronger by, by uniting. Um, our group, Singapore Product Design, holds monthly events, typically either knowledge shares somewhat like this event tonight, um, or we just do casual networking events, a lot of happy hours. And I want to point out that, that while I do claim the title of founder of this group, um, I, I do not claim the title of leader in any way. It's quite a, a horizontal uh, structure. Um, it's, it's kind of anarchist in that way. Um, but it, it is led and uh, it's, it's given its life uh, really passionate volunteers, several of whom are here tonight. So it's great to see you all. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really been one of the, the greatest pleasures of my life to, to see this kernel of an idea that I had when I relocated here to Singapore, really be embraced by the community, and me as a foreigner be accepted by the community here uh, so far away from my home and to find a, a home and a shared love of design. So Singapore Product Design, it's, if you don't know, it's a continuation of a larger network of meetup groups. Um, our big sister group, one that I founded some seven odd years ago in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Product Design, and now we've uh, branched off to also have a chapter in Los Angeles, Los Angeles Product Design, 
and we're united under this umbrella of the product design community and we're still kind of figuring out what that means um, as it's kind of organically being shaped from the bottom up by, by the members. But it is not the first community group which I tried to find. In fact, I've been I've been trying to found community groups for like a decade now. Um, featured in this image is one of the early ones that I attempted called Coding for Poets. It did not take off. <laughs> But it did. It did fortunately lead me to network with other with other other meetup founders, and uh, we were able to together form uh, a quite successful group called Creative Coding NYC. Eventually, we ran this program for one year, holding monthly talks on creative coding topics. The lecture space was sponsored by the beer company Anheuser Busch InBev. They're one of the world's largest beer brewers, and every month they would provide free beer to the attendees. So, so one tip when growing your, your meetup group, if you can try to provide free beer. And then, and then a second, uh, um, a serious one is to, to just be consistent. We really learned that um, if you're not growing, then you're dying. So we need consistent content um, to continue to attract members to, to our community. Now let's just talk about tools for a little bit. You know, in, in the early days of figuring out what Singapore product design was going to be, uh, we studied the, the current landscape of the groups here to make sure we weren't like stepping on others' toes and we were able to offer something unique. Um, and we concluded that we should just avoid talking about tools in general. So that talks about sustainability and, and job hunting and we'll be having to talk about AI and entrepreneurship next week. I'll be having to talk about user research next month. We really just talked about tools, which is why I'm so happy to be here tonight to talk to you people about one of my favorite topics. Okay, so the big, big takeaway, number one, if you're taking notes, this is the one that you should write down, to respect tools. Respect tools by maintaining them. So maintaining them includes keeping them clean. If they're cutting tools, then keeping them sharp. Uh, if they have moving mechanical parts, then keeping them oiled up, um, keeping them repaired when they need it. If you treat your tools well, then they will work for you for longer. And if we're fortunate enough to live in a place where we have access to nice tools, we shouldn't take that for granted because not everywhere in the world uh, does have access. We can respect tools by handling them safety. So, so really, when you use, especially physical tools, uh, you have to drill into your mind that, that these are dangerous. These can injure yourself or someone else. Um, safety first. And we respect tools by keeping them organized, like in this lovely image in the background. So serious tool users need things to be in their proper place. And this is true for physical tools as well as, I think, virtual environments. Um, um, it speeds up your workflow. It allows you to do your best work without having to worry about finding things. Um, in that way, respecting your tools is respecting yourself. It's also respecting the others who need to locate and use those tools, which brings me to my next big point. Tool users. Next big thing to write down. Um, we should respect tool users because why? Being a skilled laborer is a is a dignified pursuit. I think that dedicating your life's work to learning a craft is a life well lived. So we should always respect those who know how to work and know how to to make things. Who know know how to build things. Respect tool users because they benefit society. A society cannot function uh, without without tool users. They literally build the foundation. This includes construction workers, road workers, factory workers, especially those who do uh, difficult manual physical labor, uh, and especially in, in demanding or dangerous environments. And I'll bear in mind that people do not get paid based on how hard they work. Okay? The, the amount of reward and payment and wealth that people receive 
has nothing to do with how hard they work. The hardest workers that I know are not wealthy people. And many of the wealthiest people that I know don't know how to work and don't know how to make anything. But we can pay them our respect. And then finally, we should respect tool users because tool skills are shared socially. What I mean by that is that you cannot learn how to use a tool properly by yourself. That's true for almost any tool. Um, you really shouldn't try in most cases. Um, you should not just try to become an electrician. You shouldn't just be an amateur electrician doing electrical work at your house in most cases, because you will kill yourself. You will electrocute yourself and die. Um, these skills, to use these tools, uh, are shared through communities passing their skills amongst each other, just like this community for the Sigma. Okay, so obviously I have some pretty like strong opinions and beliefs that are related to tools. So I just kind of want to explain kind of the background of how I formed these opinions. Usually when I tell people where I'm from, I say a small town in Texas called Tatum. In this image, it's this it's the blob in the middle right here, which has some 1,300 people, give or take, is the population of the town. But it's not really true. I don't come from that blob. Really, where I'm from is kind of outside of the blob in this in this area of trees and and grass fields. And if you were to ask my son where I'm from, he would probably say in the middle of in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> So I grew up around things like these, these tractors and farm equipment, um, far away from any big city. And everyone that I knew kind of had this baseline of tool fluency because you had to, because you had to be uh, self-sufficient to some extent to maintain your life there. My grandfather's generation mainly lived off the land. Um, and in Texas, that, that means raising cattle. Um, even today, uh, many of my relatives raise cattle or farm hay, farm grass for hay to feed horses and cattle, cows. Eventually, my grandfather was elected by the community. It's called a, a county commissioner. It's kind of a low-level elected official that doesn't exist in this country. Um, but involved in local policy matters, and they also oversee mainly the construction and maintenance of roads and bridges. So, so this picture is not my grandfather. This is just an archival image that I found. But it does show a real road work crew uh, working on building the, the highway infrastructure in Texas in the 60s. And because of that skilled labor, uh, we were able to modernize our society into what it is today. And I want to give an example of one of my favorite tools. The design of this pocket knife is one of the most common in America. It's called a Stockman knife. We say that if your grandpa gave you a knife, it was probably this knife. So some people just call it a grandpa knife. It's a three-bladed knife with slip lock joints uh, with two blades on one end and one blade on the other. Next, next page, last page. I, uh, sorry, I'm almost done. The main blade is a clip point blade. So it's the longest blade, and it's really good for cutting wood, uh, cutting food if you need to, uh, opening a can of beans in a pinch. It's called a clip point blade because the back of the shaft is clipped off, making a sharp point, which you can puncture with. Next is the sheet clip blade. It is called so. I've been told because it was invented for shepherds to be able to trim the hooves of sheep. So you can uh, put a finger on the back of the top of the blade to exert pressure to do like a trimming motion. And then finally is the, the spade blade. It's called the spade blade because it is for cowboys and cowgirls to spay or castrate a bull calf which can be a very dangerous job. Um, and so if you look at it, it's uh, unlike the clip point blade, which is designed for puncturing. Uh, the spade blade is designed for not puncturing or not stabbing. So if things go, you know, things go sideways and you do get stabbed, hopefully it won't stab you too bad. So that's the spade blade. This is a breakdown of one of my... 
one of my favorite favorite knives. Um, also, just the feature that it has three blades is quite useful for outdoors people because if you're using one and it goes dull, then you just close it and you open up the next blade and you use that until you can get home and sharpen your tool because we should, what? What's that? Respect our tools, thank you. Let's skip forward in time a little bit um, and go around the world uh, to Zanzibar, Tanzania. Okay, Zanzibar, it's a semi-autonomous island in East Africa. It is not too dissimilar in climate from Singapore, being only six degrees south of the equator. Like many African nations, it has been deeply exploited for its resources. It was a main port for the Middle East slave trade. It was colonized by European imperial powers. And in 1964, it experienced a violent workers' revolution overthrowing the rural plantation owners. I went to live there to work as the head teacher at a village community center called Creative Solutions in 2009-2010. Uh, I visited Zanzibar before on volunteer trips with my college, and I had already begun studying Swahili language. At this community center, we taught adult education, English, computer literacy, arts and craft skills, and we ran a preschool program. <clears throat> Stop talking soon. But no matter how much I may have taught, it cannot compare with what I learned from that experience. It taught me how to see myself as a global citizen to consider uh, that anyone in the world could be a potential friend and a potential fellow community member to me. It also taught me how to use... Oh, sorry, skip this slide. These were friends at our school. It also taught me how to use a chainsaw. Um, is anyone a fan of Chainsaw Man? Raise your hand. Chainsaw Man. So, so in, in this um, manga or anime, Chainsaw Man, <coughs> excuse me, can I have a drink or something? Um, in this story, yes, this is, Kyle, we got it, we got it. My, my lovely partner is helping me out. So, so in the story, Chainsaw Man, uh, the chainsaw demon gets his power because people are afraid of chainsaws. Who's, is anyone afraid of a chainsaw here? Got some. And I get it because they're loud and they're smelly and they can seriously injure you. Um, but if you know how to use them, then they're not scary at all. They're actually quite cool. So one day we were preparing the ground next to the school building for an addition and we needed to clear a coconut palm. The brother of one of our students came, <coughs> came with his ox cart and a chainsaw and here's how he freehand milled the tree. First felled the tree. Next he, he ran a, an oiled string down the length of the log and thumped it against the tree to get a straight line and measure down uh, the thicknesses of the boards uh, down the log. Then freehanding it, just by eyeballing these, these guidelines, he was able to rip cut this log to make all the boards. Um, so these boards we then took and we used hand planers to plane them. And coconut wood is very, very, very tough wood. If you've ever used coconut wood, it's extremely hard to cut, extremely hard to work with. Uh, but we use these to create tables for the new uh, addition to this school building. So in that way, um, we literally converted this skilled labor tool use into education for the benefit of the community. <laughs> I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Um, so it brings me to a fi my final question. I really hope to inspire you to think, what will you do with your tools? Why are you learning how to be good at Figma? What are you doing? What is the point of this? So what will you contribute to society? What is your responsibility to give back? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leonard, for sharing your passion and obsession for tools, and also like your perspective around like the relationship between tools and human and design. 
Yeah, so, yep, up next, we have Ake. Ake, he will share about his community and he has been in education for around a decade. I'll let him share more. So over to you, Steve, uh, Ake. <laughs> I'll just stay on my own. I guess the fast track of all the slides. Um, I'm falling off to pretty funny people, so I hope I will achieve at least 50% of that funniness. Um, to this, I was kind of like, okay, why did Chloe invite me here? I'm not exactly a designer designer. Uh, I use Figma. I learned, about, I learned about Figma maybe a year ago, and then I started using it a bit. So I was like, okay, why did Chloe invite me here? But she told me, oh, you're pretty cool in how you design communities, right? How you design people, how you work with... Um, I use the word ontological design, designing thought and designing people's uh, ideas around things. So that case, that's why I'm here. So I'm going to just take us to an arc of a few things today. The first, I'm an educational entrepreneur. I've been running a few ventures for the last 10 years or so. I started off with play-based education. So my first part of my talk here will be about play-based education and looking at how children play. The second uh, venture, I used to run something for social and environmental education. It's called the Module Collective. Some of you might have heard of it before. Uh, so we are a collective that helps to bring young people together to take ownership of climate change and other social and environmental issues. So the second part, I talked about imagination and making it a community. How does imagination make a community? For those who are in the social sciences, I guess you have the term imagined community. But I'm going to flip it around and say imagination makes community. The last, I saw, I think you saw the last slide already. Um, don't just solve problems, um, spark imagination. I bring back to my current work, which I run a tool, an ad tech tool, um, to help people to solve problems around social and emotional learning. So I'll show you some of that in a bit. Okay, so what I do, uh, Holo Tracker is an ad tech tool that transforms assessments to focus on the whole person. And more than a two, actually, it's really a community. So we, I'll show you some of what we do later on. But basically, it's a learning community with people in schools that are, you know, learning practitioners, researchers that really use Holotracker as a way to advance learning and social emotional learning within schools. I'll show you some stories later on on how schools are creating learning communities because of how people are affirming each other in a day-to-day -day basis. It's also a community in, with parents at home. Uh, we give parents confidence to take care of their children better because now they have the language to do so. And with our teams of teams, I'll introduce this term in a bit. And you see Chloe there, who is also part of my team. <laughs> right. Um, as an educator, I find it responsible only to show people things that are important. And this was one of the reasons why we started Holo Tracker, which is that today, I think this could be quite shocking to some of us. Schools globally, not just in Singapore, globally, are failing to support social and emotional skills for children. And here you see that in an OECD report, you see that 10-year-olds actually report higher social and emotional skills than 15-year-olds, which means the more they are in school, the less confident they feel that they are developing social and emotional skills. And that's a very worrying trend. I don't go into the whole extent of this, but I thought maybe I'll just show this, and you can Google the report beyond academic learning to learn more. But let me start with this. So when I think about community, I always like to get people to think, how do children organize playgrounds? So in my first work, I was actually running a lot of programs where I get children to build cardboard villages, tear them down, and then we ask, okay, what does it mean to have a city? What does it mean to have a society? And then we will rebuild the cardboard city and say, oh, this is what we want in a school, for example, right? And why I started with this question, how do children organize playgrounds? It's because I thought it was a very inspiring way to think about work. If you go to a playground, some of you might have children, um, one sitting right at the back. And if we organize playgrounds or, or how children organize games, you see that they pick up something, they say, oh, I thought of a game idea. I'm going to stand in front of, a, in this case, a cardboard city and say, I can see the world from here. Why don't you join me? Another child might have another idea. They see what they see. Completely, probably they look at different things. 
And they say, oh, I see what you see. I'm going to join you in that game, right? And then we start having this game that we are forming together. The rules are unbounded, but we form the rules as we go along. And later on, another child comes by, looks at the chaos that's happening. They happen to be able to run around together and say, oh, I can join in that game as well. What are the rules? Oh, maybe we can look at it a different way. This is how I'm going to play this game. And I think many of us have seen this dynamic before with children. And this is actually why I thought it would be interesting to use this as a way to think about teams. In teams, I think leadership is emergent, right? We have projects that we work on. We have clients that we work with for some of us who are designers. And we often think, how do we actually manage these relationships? How often, how do we manage the people that we work with? One thing I learned from children is that leadership is emergent. You create a problem, you create a scenario of play, you allow people to come in, you ask the yes and questions, and leadership is emergent. People will start finding their ways to play together with you. I used the word teams of teams just now. I have a playground theory, but there's also someone who came up with a military-based theory, I guess. Uh, and this was quite interesting for me. Um, so there's teams that run with command, teams that run of command of teams, and then teams that run essentially like a playground, right? teams of teams. And I think this is a state that I think many of us were aspire to do so. And I thought to just bring this up as something that we can think about today as well. Second question, imagination makes community. I mentioned just now the term Imagine Communities by Benedict and Anderson. Um, so sociologist, I believe, uh, who says that basically any community is organized around the idea that we belong in, for example, a nation, right? We identify Singaporeans because we form the term Singaporean and the associated qualities of it. Now, I want to flip it a little bit, right? Because I think imagination makes a community in the way that we can inspire people to think about open questions. So in 2018, 2019, um, I thought about it for a while, and uh, after doing play-based education, I thought, okay, I'm starting to be more interested in social environmental issues, the food system, uh, oceans, people around us. And I said, how do I get people to start thinking about these things? And if you know these issues are extremely political, nobody would agree. An organic farmer would never agree with uh, someone who does extreme agri-tech, right? Uh, and, the, and the other way around. But how do you get people to the same table? And I realized that my niche in education was a good way for people to say, we can disagree on these topics, but what we can agree on is that young people need to ask these questions. So with that same philosophy, we just went around asking people like, hey, what's something that you can't solve today that a young person can solve for you maybe five years later, right? We bring these people together and we say, oh, by the way, we just spoke to someone else. Would you like to come to this event? So I always organize my work around just open questions. Right? So I ask questions like, what will a thriving ocean look like in 2030? Someone who is a marine biologist would have their own answer to that. Someone who is some, um, doing marine tech would have an answer to that. And the inspiring kind of clashing of all these narratives really bring people together to say, now we have a curriculum. So that's what we did um, with our work. We bring these people together. We ask these questions. We bring them to the classroom. And we get young people to talk to them. Right. And what I wanted to do by bringing this example up is often imagination of what could be makes a community. All these people who would usually disagree with each other were now coming together to say, oh, we can be educators. I think we can spend maybe half an hour agreeing with each other on something, right? So that's something that I wanted to bring with this example. Okay, so the last one, uh, imagination or sparking imagination. I use the tagline, oh, that's possible, because I think sometimes when we work with people, they have a preconceived notion of what things are, right? So I work with Follow Tracker. Now I'm going to tell you that we are a tool to help people measure social emotional skills. What do you think about? Maybe you are thinking about some sort of survey, some sort of test, some sort of like diagram and, and something like that. Right? So we have all a preconceived notion of what something is. And when I work with my teachers, I tell them, okay, we have a tool that gives you two screens. The first is a set of cluster of behaviors. This one you can change, you can customize your own school's framework, let's say school values, creativity, empathy, something like that. The second is a set of your students. And every time you see something, 
you tap creativity, you tap your student, and you're done. You can add qualitative details if you want. You can say, oh, he included his friend in a project work group. And then I say, OK, because we're collecting all these moments, we can use AI to create visual and written reports. Right? So maybe now that idea that you have in your head about what assessing is is starting to change a little bit, I hope. Right? Well, what's funny is when I work with schools, this is the first thing they ask me. <laughs> Can I generate this, right? So they're used to seeing a report card as A, 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 B, C, D, and then they have this section in the conduct grade, and they say, that's the only place that I have a little bit of words, right? Or maybe the remark, right? And now, you can do all that, sure, it's cool, but can you generate this? And so far, we've been doing this for three years now, um, and I've been telling schools, like, okay, if you want to, you could, right? Because we have the data to do so. But what's the point of doing so, right? And I always kind of deflect that question. I say, okay, just try it. You know, you get into the rhythm of using it. Let me show you what the schools do after they start using it. So this school, um, we generated this first report. This was in 2021, 2021, yeah. So we generated this first report and we said, instead of just looking at your conduct grade, um, we just visualize your data, right? So we just say, this is the pie chart. Everyone knows what it is. Um, actually, I showed them the radar chart first, you know, the FIFA chart, but they were like, oh, I don't think the children understand. I'm like, I think you are the one who doesn't understand it. <laughs> because anyway, so, <laughs> so we, we showed them a pie chart uh, because they taught it in math. And then we said, okay, you know, growth. Uh, I can just show you what we captured in the first few weeks and what you captured in uh, now, right? So right now what it is. Again, if you really think about it, is this really growth? Like the data increases for sure, right? Because you're using it longer. But they were like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that, there's some sort of growth that's happening. Um, with this, the school, I think something clicked in their mind. They said, okay, now I'm showing something different. It's not just the conduct grade. I need to start explaining to my, uh, my students what's happening. So they created this. They knew what a lesson plan was. They knew what it means to create good activities. And they say, let me explain to my children using the exercise. So just at the back, I'll just tell you what there is. Uh, it says, uh, student reflective or my moments of celebration. So they got their students to think about two ways that they have shown strength in the last term. And the bottom shows my tiny behavior, a school value to work on. And then the specific action and tiny behavior, they got this from the fault model, I believe. Um, yeah, so I think it's really inspiring. You get people to think about things slightly differently. You spark their imagination and you get something really, really awesome. The school took it one step further. After doing this, they got parents to contribute. And then they said, so you know how parents, um, some of your parents, you receive all these reports and you sometimes forget to sign. And then the teacher has to chase up and say, can you please sign the report card? Here, they have a parent acknowledgement form. It says, I feel blank that my child is showing this in school. I would like to show that my child also displays this at home. right? And then they get to write. And it's really touching because we see that parents now get a chance to say something that maybe they're wanting to say all the time. Um, we get teachers telling us that there are parents that usually don't attend parent-teacher conferences that now come to parent-teacher conferences. They will write long narratives to the teacher. And it's really, really amazing, right? Again, we started from this, right? We started from the same teachers asking us, can you generate this, right? And now that same teacher is going, oh, I'm designing these templates like it's my life, right? This same teacher took it one step further. <laughs> We're not there yet. So I, I think you saw this colorful slide just now. Today, this teacher, every end of the, every three weeks, she compiles all the tracker data, goes on Canva. I think she can try Figma, but she goes on Canva. Uh, <laughs> Um, and she creates these templates, right? And she says, I'm going to copy and paste uh, some of the comments that the teachers have made. Uh, I'm going to make my form teachers give their children an award, right? That says that's a credit day uh, award. And they take a picture. In the school canteen, they have a TV. And this TV plays this video with nice music that goes on. And you get children coming in front of the TV, sometimes laughing at their friends, but inside feeling very proud that their friends are there. And it's, again, an amazing initiative, right? We started from, can we generate conduct grade? So 
what I wanted to say with this with this example is when we bring tools <laughs> tools to the picture uh, tools to people, what imagination does it spark? Right? How can we actually spark people's imagination? So I'll end with this. Um, don't just solve problems, spark imagination. And now that I have the room together with me, I want to do a small exercise to show us what community means and what imagination means. Um, how many of you identify as musicians? Musicians. Okay. How many of you listen to music? Listen to music. Awesome. Okay. If you all know what's happening, um, maybe you heard this before, but I'm going to try anyway. So listen to music, right? So you can hear. So we're going to follow after me. We're going to go. That's community. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Egg, for sharing your adventures and all your funny stories about parents and teachers and kids um, involved in them as well. And it's not hard to deal with parents. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we are going to move on to the panel discussion now. So for anyone, if you have questions, please keep the questions coming in through the QR code. You can submit your questions there. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Steve to take over this session and also calling our speakers forward, Egg. Leonard and Adila. And yeah, Clint Lily. <laughs> this too, right? Okay. I'm going to take you guys because the mic around. Oh, these are not reliable. These are not reliable. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Enjoy. What about the small one? I mean, I also want to call out to again, uh, Miss City Aisha and Afik. Are you here? Let me see your hand. Okay, there you go. City, is it? There you go. So make sure you don't get locked out just after the event. This one. This one. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, I see we're all about that QR code right now. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you again so much for tonight. And thank you all very much for coming in. Let me just introduce myself quickly. My name is Steve, and I am making components in OCBC Bank. Try my best. Using Figma. <laughs> Okay, and this, oh, thank you so much. This is our last event for this year. So we want to make it chill. And I don't want to make it to be like, I will ask you some question, then you answer the question, and then you have people watching us, like putting up the show here. But I want to make it more like, let's get something spicy question towards the year. We do have some question, it's in my pocket. Um, I think the event, the, the purpose of this event is this has been the top here for everyone. And if you're looking back, we started our journey in March this year. We have our first event in Shop Back Campus. And then we had a really tough raining day in July. If some of you are there in Bedok, and there was a heavy rain, uh, we had a very intense workshop there. And we do have a few facilitators still in the audience here today. What happened to the rest? Good question. <laughs> uh, I think they're flying or traveling. Yeah, they, they probably they're flying or traveling because it's year end. Everybody's taking leave. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, should we jump into the question or you guys have any questions for the audience first? No? Oh, good. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay, let me open up my pigeonhole. Meanwhile, the, the floor is still open, so if you've got any new questions, just go ahead and feel free to scan the code and type in as spicy as you can. Okay. Um, so the first question is a highly voted question. It's actually directly talking to you, Ake. Uh, so we have a very strong feedback from the audience. They would like to work for Holder Tracker. <laughs> so are you guys hiring? I think that question can be the question of the year. Are you hiring? <laughs> um, I'll give a serious answer. Oh, I love this mic. I can feel the bass on my voice. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give a serious answer. Um, so Holotracker is kind of a strange startup. Uh, we've been around for four years. We started as a passion project. And over the last four years, I have been working with literal like freelancers, passion projectors, uh, people who just really be believe in the mission, right? Uh, we this year was our first commercial year, so we actually got our first paying school in January. Uh, we're ending the year with twenty plus schools, which is crazy for me. Um, thank you. <laughs> and because of that, uh, so the short answer is. Yes, maybe. Um, yeah, because we do have some traction. There's, there's a lot of work that's going on. Uh, we're building a lot. We're building very quickly as well. Um, and I'm at the stage where, as a founder, I'm going, okay, what do I do with this this crazy thing that's 20 plus, popping to more schools internationally as well, um, flying to Brazil this Sunday because 100 plus schools are using it at a learning conference. So it's an exciting project. So. I would love to chat with anyone who wants to work with us. Um, I can probably share my contact details somehow after this. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, maybe. <laughs> I mean, just to address, you are looking for designers, right? Well, I've always formed my team around designers. Uh, I think designers are core and key to everything. Um, I, I, My ops people have always been designers. My... Uh, people who work with sales and schools have always been designers. Um, yeah, so, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I love that quote. You know, I, I was recently re reading something like, you don't have to be doing design to be a designer. The moment when you actually make a decision, thinking about collecting information and make a decision at the end of the day, you already design your own life. So in that sense, we are all designers. We are just making different tools and we're using those tools just to make better choices at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that, Ake. And the second question is a general question. Uh, I guess you guys can actually pick up just anything that comes to your mind. Um, for all, what keeps you going on as designers for good? For good. For good. Designers for good. Designers for good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think my, my talk kind of touched on this. I, I definitely feel motivated by a responsibility. I think that design is a noble profession with the potential to leave the world in a better place than we found it. This is kind of advice that my mom gave to me when I was little, and it like really has kind of proven uh, meaningful throughout my entire life. So yeah, to try to leave things better than we found it. I mean, I, I think that you can even like take that as, as a day-to-day -day motivation, like whatever your tasks are for a given day, how can I improve these things somehow? Or how can I make the user's life a little bit easier, or a little bit nicer, even if it's just, you know, very, very small amount. That's how I stay motivated as a designer for good. Your mom told you that when you were a kid. She well, she told me to leave things better than I found. I think she was talking about cleaning my room. Uh, but <laughs> you design your room and clean your room. Yeah, I mean, it applies to like like a global level. Um, leave society better than you found it. Leave, leave projects better than you found it. Adila? 
So um, mine is a very deep reason. So basically, uh, growing up, I was more of the creative one. And I have three sisters, so I have the most creative one. Uh, my mother did try to push me into business, but then I decided not to listen to her <laughs> and did design anyway. So for me, what really motivates me and keeps me going is because I feel um, design is a calling. So you you live your life, maybe, for example, 50 to 60 years. The first 20 years of your life is spent on education. And then the rest of your life is just working. So rather than suffering in a job that you dread going, why don't you find something meaningful in your life? Be of use for the community. Be of use to your family. Yeah, so even if it's like, like for me personally, because I have small kids, so um, I came to the realization that I want to be the best role model for my own children. So rather than they look up to some random president or, I don't know, politician, <laughs> for example, or maybe some boy band or what. <laughs> yeah. So I, I rather that, I rather them have me as the best example because I'm the closest family member that they have. Yeah, so that's for me. Thank you, Adila. Yeah. I always, I want to start with the phrasing design for good. Um, I, I always have an issue when people put for good behind things because it assumes that you sh should be doing something for bad. Like, you shouldn't, right? You just shouldn't. Um, but I think I think it rips off what I mentioned just now. Like, I think good designers um, or, or designers are key and fundamental to a lot of the work or things that we see around us. Um, what keeps me going to continue to design and continue to do what I do? I think it's constantly being curious at what's something that firstly makes me angry of, of what's around me, right? But being curious about learning new things, being curious about, about seeing new things. And the more you see, the more you just want to do things. Yeah. So I guess that's what keeps me going. Hey, that motivation comes directly from you, is it? Or you also get your motivation from the people surrounding you? Oh, I'm always very inspired by, by people around me uh, and things around me. Um, I people who know me are probably annoyed at me for talking about this by now, but I've been talking about tools like Kahoot for a long time. Um, I think Kahoot is an amazing design tool, design tool, right? Um, and when I see things like that, I go, "Wow! Like, how can we do this but better, right?" Um, so, so one thing I always tell people is cover a session based stuff and then you don't get to keep the data later on because I work my whole track for that. So um I'm like, yeah, how can we do that but better? So yeah, I think it's also external stuff. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um as you can see, um Leonard, you you grew up in a traditional Texan household. And Adila, you grew up in a typical Asian Singaporean family. And Ake, I believe, is also a typical Asian family. So, Leonard, your mother told you, go seek after your dream. Adila, your mom told you, go do business. And you told her, no, I'm doing design. And Ake, what about you? It's funny. Um, my, so, I grew up with just my mom. Um, my dad passed away when I was very young. And my mom was always, I think she was, so I started my journey when I was 15. Uh, I started my first, when I was running those cardboard challenges, I was 15. And she always started with a game, like, oh, it's cool, like, do something with your life next time. Um, <laughs> but she never ever voiced it, right? I, I knew she was thinking that way um, because she would ask me what I'm going to do after that. But I, but she would never voice it. And I realized after a while that I the more I did, the more traction we got with things, like, then it got busier. So I never really had, like, a, like a flip, like, Need to do something else. I think my mom trusted me enough. I think we all have great moms. <laughs> really, even sometimes we don't really agree with them, but I know they're always hoping the best for us. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Um, let's move to the next question. Uh, okay. This is um, a specific for Adila. Um, it's regarding to your podcast. Okay. And how do you find inspiration for the topics for your podcast? And there's also one extra question. Okay. And how do you craft the content around the topic you choose? Okay. Um, so for the first is how come how on, do you content. find inspiration? Find inspiration. So it's a mix. 
So one will be um, from the news, actually. So there was one time we, we got inspired by this story about how this uncle paid, or was it auntie, paid $400 for a banmian meal. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was the UX mistake. For real? Yes, it was. But then the banmian stall refunded the, oh, okay. refunded the auntie. Yeah, so we, we, we got inspired by these kind of stories. And then... Um, basically news and then at the same time we also explored uh, for example like LinkedIn conversations I see uh, and also maybe conversations at, at work or with friends yeah that's where we get our content uh, when we are maybe like I will just look into other podcasts and get inspired from there as well but most of the time we try to find um, local stories or initiatives that we want to cover like for example maybe we saw a CNA article about UX implemented in MRT designs then we thought okay why not we have a look into that and then we explore it we give our critique our comments and then we have a spin on it and then we ask our audience for feedback yeah and then at the same time we also um in terms of structuring the content uh, what happened is we have a notion file a uh, notion page and then we will put a title and then we just vomit out all our contents inside yeah so what happens during the recording is basically we already have our content in bullet points so we just go through and then because I'm there with Shuan, so we can basically vibe off each other. Like maybe I'll start and then she comes in. Or maybe she starts and I comes in. Yeah, so that's basically how the content is. It's nothing fancy actually, guys. Yeah. I like it. It's it's really, really to the ground level. Mm-hmm. And I believe those topic ones you chose, there's always a time you can actually insert your thinking from design perspective, like mm, how yes. you improve yeah. it or how you can solve the problem. So like, for example, like the current uh, most latest episode, which is a, uh, we did a bit of a different take on scams. So we see a rise in uh, reporting on scams, be it online scams, romantic scams, um, uh, elderly scams. So we we had this idea, okay, we want, we want to talk about scams, but what would be a good direction? So we want to try to link it to design. So Shen came up with this brilliant idea to actually talk about scams. So I became the devil and put in the, the, the devil's head of being a scammer. And she comes in as an angel <laughs> and she will say, okay, uh, in, in a scams perspective, this is how it is. They have a certain persona that they're going to target. Um, they are going to target uh, lonely women, in terms of dating scams, lonely women, vulnerable, uh, very uh, rejected, abandoned. Then she will say, oh, in UX design, it's called a persona. Yeah, for example. So from there, we link it up, basically. Yeah. I see, I see. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I. That, that's a very interesting way. Do, do you also listen to those uh, the podcasts? Like, you know, we. Uh, how many of you guys listen to Daily Catch-Up? Nice. I see a few hands here. So we always have those juicy stories and questions or even social problems that's addressing in the podcast. Uh, surprisingly, I'm also running my podcast. Um, if you guys have never heard about it, it's called Paper and Pain. And my podcast partner is also in the audience today. This is Roger. Uh, he's, in, uh, he's, he's using a pseudo name today. So go ahead and have a chat with him later after this event. Uh, yes, I'm also running a design podcast, but um, I think we are more taking a very serious approach. I love you. The way we compare is the art is more serious. Us is just like chill and lit back. <laughs> Yours is like a daily catch-up version. We are the daily, I don't know, um, during version. Daily stand-up version. Daily stand-up version. <laughs> <laughs> or daily sit-down. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Adila. Okay, so next question is uh, a general question. Um, so, Leonard, you're trying to build a uh, SPD community and it's, it's getting really huge. How, and, and Adila, you're also trying to reach out to the community through your podcast and talking to a lot of people, as many as possible. And A, if you're trying to reach out to the community by building a community and build a connection between schools, students, teachers, and the parents. So the question for all of you is, uh, along the way when you try to build up the community, I'm pretty sure there will be lots of challenges, things that didn't go well. Is there anything you want to share with us? What's the biggest challenge you tried that you, 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 you encountered during this journey? 
yeah um I, I mean i can i can elaborate maybe on some points i made during my talk as i sort of revealed some of my previous attempts and and failures at starting meetup communities it, it, it was really about so so I, I started trying to get involved in in these community groups back in like 2014 so like a decade ago uh in new york city when i was living there and it seemed great and i knew that i wanted to be involved somehow um but i had i had no idea how to do it so so i think like it took years of attempting and failing and it, it, it was sort of like a prototyping process if you think of it in design terms so just to make something to try to put it out but then to observe and learn from what works and what doesn't work and try to guide your next step based on what you're seeing so the big um i mean i can i can look back now and see that the things that were not working at that point were that I, I was trying to like force an idea onto the community versus what I've come to understand that you you just have to it, it's about like making space for the community um, like figuring out how to empower the community or how, how to um, what, what's the metaphor I'm grasping I, I mean I'm trying to articulate sort of a, an abstract concept Basically, but you're running your community in sprints. You, 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 you are, but but it's like, but it's as if the it, it's like you're building a an application, but the code is writing itself. It's like you're letting the computer like write the code that it wants to write. That was jam. That was AI. Yeah, right. AI yeah, was yeah. Born. Okay, okay. Maybe it's so, maybe it's more like training an AI model, right? Um, but but yeah, really, uh, the successes that I've seen in community building is when you do everything you can to just support the community and and nurture it and grow it. It's sort of it's more like it's more like farming. Then I'll, I'll use that metaphor, that, like growing a plant or growing your crops. Yeah, just like be consistent, um, bring people together, uh, provide content, um, provide space for people to make genuine connections, and then that just kind of blossoms into its own community. Give it time to grow. And give it time. Give it time to grow. Yeah. Um, for us, basically, we because we are doing online um, podcast, so we always try to engage with our community based on Instagram, on LinkedIn, email. Email not so much, but most of, most often on Instagram. So what we did was basically because I had experience running my own um, freelance business before, so I learned a bit on marketing and content strategy. So that's why I put it into how we actually market and promote um, KSDL. So in terms of community wise, we we try to keep it simple. We we have like fun polls. We have we ask questions and we make it easy. We don't ask you guys like what do you guys think. It's a very broad question, um, and usually on social media, people don't want to think so hard. I will always get put off by people pitching to me on social media. I will tell them, can you please not talk about work? I'm here to just be socially active and happy. <laughs> yeah. So even on social media wise, we keep it simple. We keep it fun. Uh, we keep it interactive, but at the same time, we make sure that whatever that. Uh, people share with us we openly share it back to the community and also we invite comments or funny anecdotes that they have and even like friends or friends of friends who forward certain things about hey KSDL was mentioned in my team slack and then they forward it to us and we make it we make a fun uh, moment out of it and then we will share it on stories yeah so in, in a way it keeps it relatable keep it raw and genuine and, and so that we we want to let our community know that no matter how small of a feedback you give us we appreciate it yeah so for one example as well now we have a q a section in spotify so we make the question easy for you to answer easy for you to just give your um thoughts and all that yeah so the content really matters a lot in, in your practice mm. you try to create content that uh give people the interest yeah. But then I see you all. Um, that's a very different approach as Leonard. It's so Leonard, your approach is like you just give it time, they give it a little bit of support and let it grow organically. And yours is purpose of content, 
that and roll it on and keep people engaged. Yeah. Be like inviting and warm. Yeah. Be be their friend, be inviting. Yes. I see. What about it? I want to share a very spicy example. Go ahead, oh. please. But before that, I need to check. Is the recording going to be shared anywhere? <laughs> um, we can we can censor some part out. Okay. Again. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I I, I think the, the question was around challenges of a community, and um, I think some people just want to watch the world burn. Mm. Um, so we have so. I'm going to try my best to, 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 to censor on my end as well. So there was there's this school that uses our tool, and uh, the teachers really, really loved it. They, they have a great, like, they were amazing at using the tool, right? They would bring up stuff at the end of the week, and they say, oh, can you guess who I, I track, uh, or rather what I track most this week? And children would be like, oh, maybe creativity, resilience, and uh, they will guess, oh, who, who is it? And the children being children like, me, 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 me. And the teacher gets to talk. So basically, this, this school has a, a nice cadence of use. And one day, um, the lead teacher of the program left. And she hands the program to another teacher. And the teacher is someone who just doesn't want to do work, right? So she said to the teacher, this is too much work for me. I'm not going to check in with the teachers. I, I'd rather the program, like, die. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> Um, and it's true, like when she took over the program, she did absolutely nothing. Um, the, the usage plummeted, except for the few very, very enthusiastic teachers who were continuing to use the tool and continue doing all the creative stuff. Uh, one day, this teacher, the new lead teacher, decides to run a revolution. So she asked me, oh, can you give me the usage data for my school? Um, you know, and as someone who is generally positive, I, I go, oh, you want to check in your teachers finally, right? So I, I give it to her and I find out that on the next day she goes into the staff meeting and she brings up all the people who hasn't been using the tool and tells the principal, look, so many people don't want to use it. We should stop it. And there was betrayal, right? I, I think on part of like the teachers who were genuinely putting a lot of effort on me, on the on the people who were initiators in the project. And I think that's the thing about community. I think it takes some people having certain keys, certain power, certain abilities to really spoil the the milk. And uh, when I when I heard about it, I was working as some of the initiators, and so that's a solution, right? So I'm gonna focus on the solution. And I think for me, everything like really depends on momentum. And what's the biggest momentum you can bring to a community? Celebration. When people are celebrating and and making things happen. Um, there's no way to stop the moment that it's addictive, it, it spreads, it's viral. So I said, okay, um, we'll send reports to, like, the, the student reports to all the teachers who uh, have made a lot of effort, and we're going to let them share it with the parents, right? So we just send it to them, we bypass everyone, we just said, these are the reports, we designed a parent's letter, we sent it to the parents. Um, next week, I check, in, I check back in with school, and the same teacher that was running the revolution said, oh, can you help me print reports for the rest of the students? <laughs> so I guess we won the battle <laughs> with momentum. Um, but yeah, I, I think with communities, there's always those few people who would want to spoil the game for everyone. But my take on things is momentum is real. Like The, the best way to do things is to build momentum. Even if it feels like, you, like it's a cliff, you have to move. You have to move something. Yeah, yeah. that's very insightful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next question is: um, I believe all you guys uh, were you study design in school, and how did you get into design? If not, so did you study design? Did you study design in 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 uni or poly days? Yeah. yeah, okay. Maybe I'll answer first. Uh, mine is short. Uh, I always liked book design. Mm-hmm. I remember as a 15-year-old kid, I, I saw this thing called kinetic typography on YouTube. I think it was quite popular then um, at one point of time, for a very short time. Uh, and then I went on to Adobe After Effects and I tried to make my own like music and stuff. Okay. So so that was that was me, 15, with pirated Adobe. <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so that was my first foray. I, I never went to design school, but I always appreciated good design. I see. What about uh, you, Leonard? 
Um, I, I did went to design school. Uh, I was from, I'm, I feel like I'm giving you a history of my education. Um, I was from Singapore Poly. I took a diploma in digital media. Mm. Mm, that's when then uh, we had an option to either go into 3D animation mm. or interactive applications, like website design, basically, mm. and videography. Mm. So I did all three in my first year. Second year, I chose the most, the most makes sense industry, which was website design uh, back then. Yeah, so um, after that, I started working as an in-house designer. Mm-hmm. Then I took part-time degree in uh, visual communication with business mm-hmm. in uh, Unisim, which is called SUSS now. Yeah. I see, I see. That's a very classical designer's path. Yes. As a destined to be designers, and then you really follow your dream, no matter how hard your mom told you to go to business school. So I, I did. Visual communication with business. With business. Yes. I see. So you made a twist there. Mom doing business with visual communication, but you need to reverse it. Yeah. Thank you. What about you, Nana? Um, so so you're actually spot on. Have you met my mother? She because she really did. I wish I did, yeah. But so she, yeah. she didn't she did not encourage me to go into business or or medicine or law or anything like that. In fact, I studied not design even nothing that practical but um art and philosophy Mm -hmm. uh, undergraduate so so my my bachelor's degree is in in philosophy and art wow i i graduated and i moved to africa as i spoke about here um so i don't know man like i I just did a bunch of stuff um and like looking back at my journey i think like every step of the way was preparing me for my my ultimate future um as a, as a UX designer, um, in my future, like being interested in, and, and capable of conducting user research and being able to, uh, craft things and being able to, to, to resonate, to, to make things that resonate with people and, and like really care about users enough to work my ass off to make something that will improve their life. But yeah, I mean, like then I, I don't know, I, I moved to Japan and I continued teaching there and also bartending there. And then I, I was just like trying to apply my art skills in any way that I could, that people would pay me some money. No one wanted to buy the paintings I was making for some reason. Um, so, so I also started doing uh, web design over the internet. I mean, I was doing like graphic design, like anything that that I could get a gig doing, like like designing business cards, designing brochures, designing a logo, um, like anything that people would pay me money to do like creative work for. And and I just kind of learned how to write code. Um, and I was really like, I had this fake it till you make it mentality. And, and I just kind of have, had this um, naive belief uh, and confidence that I could just like figure out how to do things. You learn everything by yourself or you, you, you go and search for some YouTube. No, video. no, no. You learn through community. That's the point. So, uh-huh. so I relied on, I relied on, uh, I relied on friends. Like when I wanted to learn how to make a website, um, like I, I just like messaged my price or emailed my friends who I knew knew how to make websites and I got on YouTube and watched YouTube tutorials um, through the YouTube community. Um, and it was like posting comments and, and asking questions. I don't know, man. And then like, I, eventually I just sort of got my foot in the door. I, I did eventually go back to school. Um, I got a post baccalaureate uh, degree and I'm currently now getting my master's in, in design management. So, so I'm wow. still trying to, study to be a designer hopefully i'll get the one very impressive yeah that's very impressive then um I, I hope you get your degree as soon as you can i'm not trying to impress you I, i'm just trying to make uh, the point that like <laughs> you, you, you can it doesn't matter what background you came from so mm-hmm. everyone has a unique a, a unique life a unique perspective a, a unique life path and that like makes your design work all the more uh powerful i see yeah thank you for that um, let's move on to you. Uh, we're running a little bit over time. Chloe, do we still have enough time? We don't. Right, okay. My bad. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm probably dragging you guys into oh, Maybe just one more last question before we close this. Uh, okay. So, yes, just now you guys are talking about um, when you start his career, um, 
some of you are like, for example, like Adina, you are like professionally trained, professionally educated designer, and Ake, you are like you want to do something completely different, actually, but you always appreciate design along the way. And Leonard, you are you are impressive, right now, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but um, I'm pretty sure we do have uh, many junior designers in our audience today, and we do receive a question that. How do you encourage the design community in the company that has the most zero UX maturity at all? Good question. Spicy question. Oh my god, dude, it's it's the worst. It's a nightmare. Um, I I would say just like if you're in a so the question is how do you design within a company that has zero UX maturity, or at least you encourage the design community. How, so, sorry, how but, do you encourage the design community in a company that has almost zero UX maturity? Okay, so you're working in a company with with little to no UX maturity. Um, no one understands what you mean when you say design. Uh, if you start saying design, they're imagining that you're talking about like dancing around with paintbrushes or doing net card design using canvas. So I, I would say like the way to okay, so the question is how do you how do you raise the maturity or how, how do you how you encourage, encourage the, the culture of design? Mm -hmm. I would say first of all, don't get discouraged and celebrate the small wins because you can't take you can't take an organization from level one to level six. You you can only like nudge the meter little by little. So that's a huge celebration if you can make you know these small impacts hmm. i i agree to what you have to say because basically i find that as i think you, your question was for more junior designers right mm -hmm. yeah so i actually read something on linkedin about this so they were saying as a junior designer don't be too focused on th these extra things make sure you get your work done um, you actually perform what you are being tasked to do, get the job done basically, and um, make sure that you are actually keep hitting all your promises as well. Um, and in terms of trying to advocate for a design sense or design community in the company, be open to maybe speaking to people on a personal level, like maybe asking for a coffee chat, uh, bringing them up for lunch, and then get to know them even further. Because in terms of uh, working well with these people, if you know their motivations, what brings them to work, what motivates them, what makes them drive, drives them at work, basically, mm -hmm. you you try to eventually get to know them on a personal level, mm -hmm. and then you uh, let them know like how you are performing at work. And then maybe in conversations when you are not there, this person might actually bring up about you saying, hey, so-and-so is good in this certain thing. And then from there, they will start to realize, oh, actually design helps certain parts of the business, certain parts of the project. Yeah, so I would say, don't put too much pressure on yourself as a junior designer, like what Leonard also mentioned, from level zero, you're trying to hit level six, and you're just a junior designer. Uh, you, will, you will just burn out fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so focus on what you can control, control the things that are within your control. Yeah, make changes that you think is beneficial in the short run first. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the small wins. And over time, when you build more connections, network, you have this leverage of people backing you up. Mm -hmm. Then that's where you can start thinking about, hey, I think we should have like, um, I don't know, design sharing with the business partners and all that. And they'll be open to it because they get to know you already. Yeah. But like, um, before I answer, I would say listen to them. Don't listen to me. I, I have no experience doing this. Um, and my answer is going to be very extreme. I would say quit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so I, 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 I'll, I'll, substantiate, yeah. I'll substantiate myself. Uh, no, I, I mean, yes, sure. Quit and join him. Yeah. <laughs> but let's put it this way. I, I think companies that do not have any UX maturity at all are just bound to fail. Um, they they may have succeeded for certain reasons, such as not having alternatives in a pre AI world. Uh, they may have succeeded because they have certain dynasties that are that exist for them. But in today's world, where there's so much more democratic access to information, where AI allows the true artists, the true designers, to really shine, I would say, what's the excuse? Um, there will be companies that will replace these companies, and there will be companies that will hire you if you quit. Um, that really want good UX and I think 
that's, that's my extreme point. I listen to them. I like the answer. I, I really like the answer. Thank you so much. And thank you for tonight, for all the questions you guys had. That was fantastic. So, yeah. Thank you again, Leonard. Thank you, Adila. And thank you, Ake. And thank you all for coming tonight. We hope you enjoyed. And let's put an end for this year. Chill and happy holiday. Oh, okay, before you go, give me five minutes. It's my working. Oh, yeah, this. Yeah, can we put up the closing slides? Subscribe.